بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم and greetings of peace uh, my name is Safir Ahmed and I have the honor of welcoming all of you in this room and the folks watching us online uh, on behalf of Zaytuna College and on behalf of Renovatio which is the journal of Zaytuna College um, I have the privilege of serving as the editor of Renovatio and also overseeing the publications department at Zaytuna College First, I want to ask, uh, run you through a little bit of what's going to happen tonight with the program. Uh, we will have a talk by President Hamza Youssef of Zaytuna College, who is also, I would say, the visionary behind Renovatio. Um, after that, we will follow it up with a discussion, a lively discussion, I hope, with three, um, when three of our advisory board members will join us, Imam Zaid Shakir, uh, Dr. Mahan Mirza, Sister Marian Farina. Um, so that will be the program, and we'll try and finish the program by 8.15 our time, God willing. Um, and that will be California time for those of you who are watching, 8.15. And then uh, after that, we'll have a nice reception and some book signings for the new journal that we have. Um, this is, I just got it today. I found, put my hands on it today for the first time, so here it is for those of you who want it, and it'll be in a bookstore for those of you who are here, and you can order it online as well at renovatio.zaytuna.edu. Um, we, before we dive into the program, I want to quickly express our gratitude to a few key people who've made this possible, who brought us to this day. Uh, first of all is the is Zaytuna College and the leadership of Zaytuna College for um, seeing the value and the potential of this project and supporting it uh, to make it happen and financially supporting it. Uh, next, I also want to thank the John Templeton Foundation. Um, they gave us a generous planning grant, uh, which is very crucial to us, and they've been very supportive of this project so far, and they have um, been very key to bringing us to this point where we actually have a website and a print journal, and today, um, the first public event. Um, all of these will be more to come, more content, more print journals, more events. Um, so the last uh, group I want to thank is the um, advisory board of Renovatio and also um, Dr. Mark Delp, who has been our, who's our dean of faculty, who's been a great help in uh, consulting with the editorial team and helping us get to this point. Um, and of course, last, um, I do want to thank the editorial team that's been working with me on this. Um, I'm privileged to work with these people, and I will name at least a few of them who are here tonight as well. Uh, first of all, Najib Hassan, uh, Uzma Husseini, Carol Nassar, Imran Malik, and there's many others who have been working as well to make this happen. <clears throat> And Tom Devine and Jude Berman, um, Yusuf Malik, um, I should <laughs> name everybody actually. Um, the last group I want to thank are the people who support Zaytuna College. Um, it is your support of Zaytuna College which is, makes Renovatio possible, really. So if you want to support Renovatio, support Zaytuna College. Um, that's how we'll, we'll grow and that's how we'll, uh, you can help us. Um, after that, I want to just quickly tell you about um, the Renovatio, the idea behind it. We'll talk more about this at the um, discussion when we have it. But the, today, this launch event is really a major milestone in, in this journey we've begun. Um, and for Zaytuna College, um, for the Muslim community, I believe, and inshallah, more broadly than that, for people of faith across the country. Um, this is a attempt at um, our starting assumption in doing this journal has been to um, we conceived this as a project that would bring the voice of religious scholars, uh, theologians, you know, uh, philosophy people, his, historians, and others to the public square, as we like to call it. Um, so we want to bring the voice of these scholars who have the knowledge base, who understand the world in a different way than a lot of us do and so they can contribute to the public discourse about all the contemporary challenges and the moral challenges we face today. 
Um, so I'll, I'll give you one short paragraph that we have in our About section of Renovatio, which sort of encapsulates what I think uh, Renovatio is about, is we ask scholars, theologians, and writers to examine timeless questions and today's moral challenges by drawing from the enduring texts of revelatory faith traditions and current thinking from philosophy, theology, and ethics to history, politics, social sciences, and beyond. Um, so we have conceived Renovatio as a hybrid publication between a traditional academic journal on the one hand and a, a general interest long form sort of magazine on the other hand. So this is trying to do bridge both those um, ends. And so it's a very new project. It's some, somewhat unprecedented, I think. Um, and it's primarily for an audience of educated, literate people. Um, and we hope uh, that we'll, this will happen as we proceed. Um, let me get to invite our first speaker, President Hamza Yusuf of Zaytana College, who also serves as the editor-in-chief of Renovatio. Um, I think I want him, I hope he will share his thoughts about religion and its place in modern society, uh, which speaks itself to the mission and the vision of, the, of Renovatio. So please welcome Hamza Yusuf. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslim and kathira. Everything begins with uh, ideas, just something, people have something in mind. This once was something other than it is now, but somebody had an idea to build a, a place of worship. It was a Christian place, a house of worship, and then uh, it became a Muslim college that was also uh, in the minds of some of the Muslims uh, in, in, uh, in the area, Imam Zaid, Dr. Hatim, myself. So uh, things begin with ideas and ideas are very intriguing because they're the contents of our mind and, and yet at the same time very often we really fail to examine the contents of our mind and that's why we chose to begin the first journal with uh, the topic of metaphysics, which is really about examining uh, assumptions. Uh, the Islamic civilization was a civilization, uh, it was a qualitative civilization and a quantitative civilization. It, it, it was a civilization of, of ideas in the mind, but it was also a civilization that produced many things in the real world and, and impacted the real world. And it had two <coughs> foundational sciences. One of them was grammar. Uh, it was a civilization that was obsessed with grammar. And arguably, the Muslims probably did more to promote grammar than any other civilization in human history. And we have much debt to the Islamic civilization in terms of language. Uh, even the Jewish tradition, which based their um, lexicons on the Muslim lexicons, because the Muslims were really the first people to, to produce uh, serious dictionaries. And the, we owe a great debt to the Persians for their incredible uh, analysis of the Arabic language, uh, the deconstructing, and then the putting together again of the Arabic language. But it, grammar was everything to the Muslims because they took language incredibly seriously and they also wanted to understand revelation. They wanted to know what, what are all the possibilities of these sentences in the Quran. There's so many possibilities. Uh, I'll just give you one example. Uh, the Quran says uh, uh, not to, um, to debate with uh, the people of the book except in the most beautiful way. Illa ladina zalamu. It says illa. Um, illa in Arabic is usually used as, a, as uh, an exception, except for. But some of our scholars argued in this case, illa here is, is actually a conjunction, meaning and, and also. But it was done with the illa to point out that it's actually difficult to do that. So there's just an example. And, and then there are many examples from Arabic poetry where illa is used as a wow, wow al ataf. It's used as the conjunction and, and also. That's just one example. But when you get into tafsir, what you see is that our scholars were just 
trying their best to see and exhaust all the possibilities in every verse in the Quran and in every hadith or statement of the Prophet ﷺ. And the way to do that in their understanding was first and foremost through grammar. And that's why they were obsessed. But the second great obsession of the Muslims was uh, geometry. And this is why everywhere you go in the Muslim world, you will see ge uh, geometric patterns everywhere. You'll see them in their tessellations. You'll see them in their mosaics. You'll see them in all of the mosques, the great mosques that the Muslims built. Uh, even the great mosques of, uh, of, of uh, Turkey, which were designed after the Christian uh, churches. Uh, you will see all of this geometry. Euclid was studied uh, obsessively by our scholars. Euclid is reintroduced into uh, European civilization through the great Arabic commentaries on Euclid. Uh, the, the, the Muslims were literally obsessed uh, with the book, the 13 books of Euclid. Uh, Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi said that uh, in his rahla, he said, by the age of 15, I had mastered the 13 books of Euclid, and I was capable of uh, of working out uh, star positions with an astrolabe at 15. So you can imagine uh, what kind of civilization uh, that was when the 15 year olds had done. In, in our uh, high schools, we study three of the 13 books in what's called high school geometry. Uh, but one of the things about Euclid and why he's so important, and Euclid is arguably one of the most influential human beings that ever uh, lived. His book had a massive impact on Western and Muslim civilization. But one of the reasons why Euclid is so important is because Euclid is a metaphysician. Euclid, you cannot do those theorems without going to the assumptions. Euclid gives you at the very outset of his book and then the chapters that need uh, further elucidation. He gives you the axioms, the assumptions, the common notions, and he lets you know that th these are things that cannot be proved. These are the first principles. And, and so what metaphysics is, is it's going to the first principles. And this is why Muslims always began their sciences with the 10 mabadi, the, 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 the starting places of their sciences, to let you know a definition. We have now, right next door, uh, a graduating class from Berkeley that are getting BAs. A lot of them are getting BAs, Bachelor of Arts. If you ask them what that BA, what, what are the arts? that you are now a bachelor in. Um, most of them really, I don't think, could answer that question. Because the BA, we inherited the BA from an ancient tradition, which is the tradition of the liberal arts, these, these sciences that are supposed to free us from the fetters of our faulty thinking. And, but, but now, it, it really doesn't have any meaning. And a lot of our students now, are given incredible assumptions uh, from their teachers, but they're never taught what are the metaphysical foundations of the civilization. They're, they're never taught about those first principles uh, of the civilization. And just to give you a few very quickly, uh, one of them is that um, anything that can't be proved uh, empirically or is not true by definition, what they call an analytic proposition, uh, Anything other than, than those two, either empirically provable or something that's true by definition, what they call the verification principle, is, is gibberish. From, from, from gibberish is actually from Jabir, because uh, Jabir ibn Hayyan, his books on chemistry were translated into Latin. They were so difficult to understand, the Latins called them, uh, the, the medievals called them gibberish. So that's, but, but literally, uh, metaphysics, uh, theology, uh, theology is now seen as meaningless. If you, may, if you say there is no God but God, many, many people in the humanities and philosophy departments today will say that's a meaningless statement. That's an assumption of the civilization. Another foundational assumption that people don't really think about is, is, is that science, do, do we call, for instance, is Isaac Newton a scientist? Because in many ways, this civilization would not recognize Isaac Newton as a scientist because he had many, many uh, metaphysical uh, assumptions about his, uh, his work and, and his worldview. Um, he, he believed, for instance, deeply in God. He believed in the Bible. Uh, he believed that the world was a supernatural event. Our modern science says that you cannot have recourse to the supernatural to explain anything. And this is why Darwinism makes so much sense because you've eliminated the, the, the metaphysical 
perspective. You've eliminated the divine. So you cannot explain being by something outside of being. You cannot explain being by something that cannot be proved empirically. And therefore, we have to determine where did life come from? Without God, where did life come from? That is a metaphysical assumption. And that's why Darwin is so compelling because he's making that assumption. He, he's assuming that we cannot have recourse to the divine because if we do, it's no longer scientific. That is an assumption of this civilization. That's not an assumption of our civilization. So these are really important uh, distinctions that are, are often not made. Another one is the idea, for instance, that belief is irrational. Or belief, people say, belief, I, why should I have faith in something? Because faith is believing without evidence. This, this is a very common trope in modern culture. Uh, you'll hear it from all the, what they call the new atheists, people like Sam Harris, who will literally say, you know, faith is belief without evidence. That has never been true for the Abrahamic tradition. Um, one of the most important uh, aspects of the Abrahamic traditions was to ground their faith in reason. And, and they gave very, you cannot study, you, if you take a survey course on religion, like the philosophy of religion, they'll do St. Thomas Aquinas, his five proofs for the existence of God. And they give them in very superficial, these truncated versions, reductive. Um, you have to spend a great deal of time to understand what Aquinas, and three out of the five he got from the Muslims. But you have to, you have to work very hard to understand why he came to those conclusions. The Summa is a summary of those. He has an entire metaphysical approach to those five proofs for the existence of God, which would used to take about 15 years before you could actually study those and really understand those proofs. Now they're taught in, in a philosophy course on religion as if, well, here it is. Here's their proofs for the existence of God. No, those aren't the proofs. Those are the conclusions of the proofs. Um, and, and the same is true for the Kalam cosmological argument that the Muslims embedded their um, worldview in. The Kalam cosmological argument takes a good deal of time to understand. It, it can't be understood uh, simplistically. So our civilization, it's, it's, it's not my contention. Uh, it's the contention of some of the most brilliant minds in our civilization right now. Um, one of them is Sayyid Naqib al-Atas, who is, who is a true metaphysician, uh, who, who really believes that the root of our crisis is a metaphysical crisis. And until we address the metaphysical crisis, we will only be dealing with the superficial. Uh, you, have, you have the political, you can, you can address things at the political level, but the political level is very superficial. I'll give you one example. In the book of uh, politics, Aristotle talks about what, something called stasis, which is civil strife. And, and he has theories for, for stasis, why civil strife emerges. He gives the efficient cause, the material cause. He gives the, uh, the, the final cause. He doesn't deal with the formal cause of stasis. Uh, and, and, and the formal cause in Aristotle's uh, approach, his metaphysical approach to understanding things, is always the most important cause. Uh, to, to understand what a thing is. Like, what is civil strife? What is it? But it's, it's something that can be understood. You, you can understand why it happens. And his argument is that you should do all you can to prevent it before it happens. Because if you don't, it's much more difficult to remedy. One example, the founding fathers understood that slavery was wrong. They, they, they were very aware of the problem of slavery. It wasn't like they, they didn't know that it was a problem. But because of the economic imperatives they had, they chose not to address the issue. They kicked the ball down the, down the field. Yeah. They knew that it was going to be addressed. They knew. Yeah. But they just kicked it down the field. We'll let other people deal with this. And some of the founding fathers considered this a grave mistake, like uh, Benjamin Rush. Then the Civil War happens. So now the problem, because it wasn't remedied at the, at the outset, it's a full-blown crisis. We're still dealing today, 150 years later, with what happened 
over 200 years ago and then what happened 150 years ago with the Civil War. We're still dealing with the consequences because the root problem was never addressed. The root problem was never addressed. The Syrian Civil War, how did it come about? There are reasons, it can be understood, but they will be dealing with the Syrian Civil War for decades, if not for uh, a century or more. These things don't go away. They're profoundly painful. So we're in a crisis. Um, just one of the things that we tried to highlight in, the, in this uh, was, was the importance of the centrality. But I, I just want to, um, people know who uh, Chertoff is? Does anybody remember Chertoff? I know Imam Zaid, he's a political scientist. Of course he knows who he is. Uh, <laughs> Does anybody know who Chertoff is, other than Imam Zaid? Remember Chertoff? Who was he? He's the guy that brought in all the, that Israeli technology into the airports, right? He was the head of Homeland Security, right? Wasn't he? Yeah. Well, his father was Gershon Chertov, who did his PhD on uh, Imam al-Ghazali. <laughs> but in it, he says, Ghazali's influence began to be felt in the middle of the 12th century. He did not become an authority for the Jews until much later. During the great controversy about the acceptability and the authority of philosophy, all through the 13th and part of the 14th century, none of the contending parties made use of Al-Ghazali's name or any of his treatises, even though his ethical work had already been translated during the early period of the struggle. The important works of Al-Ghazali were subsequently translated into Hebrew and played an important role in the Jewish literature of the Middle Ages. We shall limit ourselves, however, mainly to the translation of the Maqasid. The Maqasid served for the Jews as a textbook of the peripatetic philosophy, according to the version of Ibn Sina. And Al-Ghazali, whatever his own attitude in writing the Maqasid, came to be regarded by the Jews, by the virtue of it, as the chief popularizer of philosophy in the Jewish community. Right. So this, this, is a Jew <laughs> this is a Jewish man. Uh, who got his PhD from Columbia University on Ghazali's influence on the Jewish community uh, based on his, his philosophy. One of the, uh, Ghazali wrote the Maqasid, it's basically based on one of the books of, uh, of Ibn Sina. He took a book of Ibn Sina and he basically wrote philosophy for dummies. Literally, if it was published today, it would be called philosophy for dummies. And, and, and the, the scholars actually um, censured Imam al-Ghazali for doing it because they said he made philosophy accessible to a much larger audience because Ibn Sina is, is very abstruse, he's difficult to understand, whereas Ghazali was very clear in his exposition. And so they argued that he, he's done a grave disservice by writing this book. But what al-Ghazali did, he wrote Maqasid of Falasifa, which is the aims or the intentions of the philosophers, and then, and he was neutral. He just presented peripatetic philosophy, this is what they say, and all the peripatetics looked at it and said, you've done a marvelous job. Once he, they said that, okay, in other words, I understand your philosophy, absolutely, it's, it's a remarkable work of incredible clarity. You've made very difficult thought, easy to understand. Then he wrote to Hafat al-Falasifa, the incoherence of the philosophers. Now we have imams that have no training in microbiology and they write books on why evolution is not true. Right? Write a, a book on evolutionary biology that's recognized by evolutionary biology and then follow that up with why you don't think. This is part of the problem with our civilization. It's become a very simplistic, uh, civilization, its approach to problems is very simplistic. And this is not to say that everybody should become a metaphysician, on the contrary. There's not a lot of people that can, can actually do the work. It's difficult work. But if you don't have those people, then you have a major problem because you lose the intellectual defenders of your faith. You lose the intellectual defender. And then the defense becomes either fanaticism or even worse, violence because fanaticism often leads to violence. When you have defenders of the faith, intellectuals, the other thing that you lose is you lose the intelligent members of your community because they have questions and they don't find answers for those questions. The world is a very troubling place and if you don't think so, I don't know what planet you're on. But the world is a very troubling place and, and, and to try to understand what the world is, what our place in the world is, to try to understand these things is very difficult. 
And, and for some people that are blessed with pure faith, uh, a very simple faith, what, what uh, Imam, uh, uh, Imam uh, al-Razi called Imam al-Aja'is, the faith of old women. You know, there, there's a famous story where he was walking with a lot of his students, uh, dozens of them, and an old woman asked uh, one of the students who was the man. And she, don't you know that's Fakhruddin al-Razi? He has 70 proofs for the existence of God. And she said, why would he need 70 proofs? He must have 70 doubts. <laughs> and when Razi heard that, he said, you should have the faith of old women. You know, that's, the, that's real faith. And so it's very beautiful, the faith of old women. That, that's a beautiful faith. You know, we call them, I grew up in the Orthodox Church, the yayas. You know, they were always in the black. And they were the ones, they were always the first ones at church, the last ones to leave. The men usually sat outside smoking cigarettes, waiting for the mass to get over. But those women, and they've kept Islam alive. You know, people like uh, uh, Sayyid Mubin's mother in, in our region, who, who's taught so many children the Fatiha. You know, these women that have this incredible, remarkable faith, uh, a deeply rooted faith. But that faith, believe it or not, can easily be lost. Not with that generation, but with the generation that comes from that generation. Because that generation was a generation that grew up in a different time. And so we're losing those people. And that's why it's so important. Um, because when we lose our, um, our, our intellectual foundations, then unfortunately the devotional foundations often follow. Um, and finally, in conclusion, this uh, book was really, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's called Aqid al Nisafiya. This book was the book that was studied in, uh, in the later um, Muslim colleges, and usually with a commentary by Sa'duddin al Taftazani, one of the great intellectual giants of our tradition. And to give myself and the students some hope, he was actually considered very, very stupid when he was in the madrasa. And he had just an opening, and, and suddenly, uh, became uh, extraordinarily brilliant um, and, and they, they attribute it to his sincerity but, uh, and that's why we don't really believe in IQ tests and we don't believe in even now we know that these things are plastic that the brain's plastic uh, we believe in Al-Fatah is one of the names of God is the opener but God can give you openings He can open your heart you know, the, 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 literally a flowering of the heart can happen uh, people can have intellectual awakenings, just like they have sexual awakenings, emotional awakenings. They can have intellectual awakenings. They can have spiritual awakenings. And in our tradition, an intellectual awakening is a spiritual awakening because intellect and spirit are not separate. That, 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 that the mind itself is immaterial. The mind is a spiritual phenomenon. That's why really what's happening right now is a spiritual experience. It's just we're veiled to it. But consciousness itself is a spirit. People always say, you know, I want to have a spiritual experience. You are having a spiritual experience. It's called being conscious. What you have to do is wake up to it. And that's why you're already there. You just have to realize that you're already there. But this book, which is, is a truncated uh, summary of a vast metaphysical tradition. And at the later period, they were no longer studying that tradition. They were studying. The, the fruits of that tradition. And that's why so many of our scholars that have studied um, don't really grasp the underlying uh, foundations of this because they did not get the tools uh, to do that. Uh, and and it's, it's one of the major problems. And, and everything comes out of that. In, in, in other words, the metaphysical foundation of your tradition is going to inform your ethics, your economics, and your politics. Muslims never produced a Machiavelli. All of our political literature is ethical. We, we never produced a Machiavelli. Uh, Muslims no longer have serious ethical philosophers, and so we're in crisis there, which is why uh, you can have scholars defending suicide bombing because they don't understand the implications of what suicide bombing actually means, right? What it means ethically, morally. The idea of opening the door of suicide, one of the gravest sins, a sin against the gift of life, uh, opening up the door of suicide to depressed people, to people that just want to check out of the planet. There's a lot of them around. Some of them, the only thing that's keeping them here is their faith. So you open up the door within the faith 
and suddenly, who wants to hang around here? Okay. You know, anyway, I'm, we're happy to see Dr. Mahan back in the corridors and thank uh, Sister Marianne Farina, who's been such an incredible support. Um, I, I truly believe that for us as a Muslim community, uh, if we're going to have a future in this country, it has to be with a serious alliance with the other religious communities in this country, which includes the Catholic community. It's probably the closest community to us uh, in terms of just tradition and, and a lot of our uh, values. Uh, with the evangelical community that uh, finds Islam uh, a demonic religion, an odious religion. We just, uh, I was in Abu Dhabi and we had an event with 10 evangelical rabbis 10, uh, uh, evangelical rabbi, ten, 10 rabbis, 10 evangelical ministers, and 10 imams. And, and the evangelical ministers, it was just amazing, the breakthroughs that they had. They spent three days in workshops. There was no lectures. It was sitting down. They were honest with each other, what you feel about our religion. Uh, the Jews, the Muslims, and the Christians sat down and had a conversation, and the outcome was really life transforming for the people that were involved in it, including myself. And so it can happen, convivencia, you know, the idea of conviviality, of living together. This has happened in the past. It's happened within the Christian community. It's happened within the Muslim community. And it's happened within the Jewish community. All three of us have lived together. The Muslims have lived with Hindus. They've lived with Buddhists. They've lived with Zoroastrians. They've lived with Catholics, Orthodox, and all of the other iterations of Christianity. And it's, it's a checkered history, undeniably. There's good and bad in it on all sides because we're human. Um, but there are really beautiful, bright spots. And, and that's what we need to look at and, and try to, to make that real here. Thank you. OK, thank you for that. Um, we're now going to move into a little lively discussion, I hope. And I'm going to invite. Um, our panelists, first I'd like to ask uh, Imam Zaid Shakir to come up here. He's a co-founder of Zaytuna College um, and a senior faculty member. He has taught uh, courses in Arabic, Islamic history, politics, and contemporary Muslim thought. Uh, Dr. Mahan Mirza, uh, who, as uh, Sheikh Hamza mentioned, is uh, back in our corridors. He's our former dean of faculty. Um, and I want to say some, one other thing about Mahan. He has been involved in the birth of this project. He was very instrumental working with me and others here to get this project in the planning stages when we were talking about it more than a year ago. Um, and now he's at the University of Notre Dame and he's, lead, he's a lead faculty um, on a project uh, advancing scientific and theological literacy in the madrasas in India. Um, last but not least, uh, Dr. Sister Marianne Farina, who as Sheikh Hamza mentioned has been a long standing friend of Zaytuna College and as our neighbor. She is a professor at the uh, uh, Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology and uh, also one of the reasons why Zaytuna is on the Holy Hill, as we say here. Uh, and she's, all three of them are also on our advisory board. And I would also ask Sheikh Hamza if you would like to, okay, we'll start a conversation here with them anyway. So please have a seat and we'll get started. Um, and I think what I would like to do is just, uh, as we talked earlier, I mentioned this and Sheikh Hamza mentioned this as well. One of the reasons we've got this um, journal, we've launched this journal both as a uh, multimedia journal, both for uh, in print, in on the website, um, and now doing public events as well, is because we feel that there's been an absence, a conspicuous absence, I would say, of religious scholars particularly in the public discourse about contemporary challenges that we all face today. Um, Imam Zaid, I want to ask you, begin with you and ask you, um, do you think that absence, and I'm not talking about sort of religious people who are activists. I'm just talking about theologians, religious scholars in academia and, and, and elsewhere. Um, do you think that's because their concerns seem a little bit narrow for the broader public discussion? 
I mean, people talk about everything from you know ethics and morality to environmental issues to justice to all of these kinds of issues. Do you think the interests um, of the religious people, scholars, has been a little too narrow? Or do you think that's that one of the reasons why they've been sort of absent? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. First, let's give uh, the college, uh, the president, Sheikh Hamza, the team that was working on this beautiful publication, give them, and the publication. I mean, one article is about all things having perception and awareness, so the, give the journal itself a rousing hand. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I, th I think one of the reasons for uh, uh, the absence of the theologian, if you will, from the uh, uh, wider public conversations, uh, number one is the dearth of theologians, that you just don't have that many really theologically minded people who are, are capable of really uh, making a healthy, meaningful contribution to many of these uh, issues you mentioned, there are definitely people there, but there are few in number. And I think one of the challenges is to, pro to begin to produce those institutions that produce the theologians who merely by uh, their numbers will, be, will find themselves situated in these various spaces. Uh, another reason I think, uh, and it's related to the lack of numbers, is just uh, a division of labor. I think uh, many theologians are busy trying to save themselves and their families and uh, their institutions in many mm -hmm. instances. And that creates such a demand on their time that they just don't have the bandwidth to get involved in a, in a lot of popular causes. And finally, uh, there, there's a, a litany of things we can mention, but I'll limit myself to these three. Finally, I think that uh, the demand from the public that's become so en enamored with empiricism and so enamored with uh, the crisis of the day, uh, so it, it calls for journalistic solutions, journalistic type analysis and not the deeper analysis that theologians can bring to the question. So I think the public demand in many instances isn't there. And I think as uh, short-sighted journalistic solutions fail, and many of the ways Sheikh Hamza mentioned, I think that people will begin to demand the theological voice. And I think mm -hmm. you'll see an expand with the, the combined weight of institutions that are creating more theologians, the perception that the reigning paradigm has failed uh, will create a, a demand for the theological voice to, to come back into the public square. And just quickly, uh, the power of creating teachers who will teach the masses. Mm -hmm. uh, Sheikh Hamza mentioned the Civil War. The, at the Civil War, the African, uh, newly fre freed African slaves were li almost zero literacy, zero percent. By the turn of the century, so less than 35 years later, 35, 40 years later, you had 70% literacy. So how did that happen? It happened because a network of teachers' colleges were established, and you had committed uh, uh, educators coming down from New England and elsewhere to man those colleges and woman those colleges. Uh, and then they trained a generation of teachers that went out and trained a nation. I think theologically that's something that we mm -hmm. have to do. Um, you mentioned public demand, which is an interesting uh, thing because I think there's a feeling out there among a lot of people of, pe people of faith um, that there is in the general public that there's actually a bit of a hostility about people of faith, about religious voices coming in that the secular sort of nature of society has, has created this, you know, you know, keep, stay home, keep your religion at home idea. I so I wonder if you would- faith are more people of, are following people who lack faith, and as a result, they despise and disdain people of faith. 
you know, many Muslims know more about uh, the social theories of Foucault or Theodore Adorno or Max Horkheimer or Karl Marx. None of these men have faith. And so when these become the architects of the popular mind amongst Muslims and other religious communities, and then the people of faith are syst being systematically removed from their faith and secularized in their thinking, even though that secularized thinking has a religious veneer. How is that for controversy? <laughs> <laughs> Um, Sister Maria, do you, in, in the Christian tradition, you've been involved for a long time among, you know, um, in both the Dominican order but beyond that in the broader Christian community. Um, have you, is there a sense also of what I'm referring to, which is this idea that, you know, when people step out of the church, when st people step out of there into discussing public issues, in, you know, contemporary moral challenges, especially ethical issues, um, or any other um, contemporary challenges, that there is a resistance of any sort. Do you feel that? Do you, do you have that perception? And do people in your circles have that perception as well? Well, the role of religion in the public square um, is one that um, there's a lot of misunderstanding of religion, religion's role in the public square. Mm -hmm. um, there is a distrust, and that comes from uh, perhaps the idea that uh, religion is coming with a particular agenda mm -hmm. and that um, it's not going to play fair at right. that table of debate. Right. Um, but uh, interesting, a couple of years ago, there was a major conference that took over, uh, that was over at the University of California. It was basically religion in the public square. Mm -hmm. And we spent three days I think you were there, Mahan. Uh, we spent three days discussing the role of religious bodies in the body politic. The room was filled with lawyers. <laughs> there was only a few theologians there, invited, right. or right. philosophers right. there. And we asked the substantive questions, the questions that were similar to what Sheikh Hamza was talking about, the whys, mm -hmm. from wheres, <laughs> what ifs, we were asking the broader questions as to what are the consequences of these discourses and decisions that we're making. We were trying to bring the, uh, a deeper consciousness as to who it is that we are right now as we are in this circle discussing uh, particular ideas or strategies and who is it that we are going to become because of this discourse and the decisions that we make. So those ethical, conscious questions are what religions can bring. I think the perception is that we are religious institutions who will be bringing questions that only come from our confessions of faith and not really those broader questions that are the questions that we even bring to our faith. Um, and so I think that that's part of the problem is that people think that we're not honest brokers in the debate. Right. And um, I think as from a Catholic perspective, we believe uh, very convincingly that religion belongs in that circle of discernment and that it isn't, religious freedom doesn't mean, well, you can go practice your Catholic services on Sunday, we're not gonna bother you. Religious freedom means I have the freedom to express my religious convictions and to raise questions that come from my religious foundation right. in the public square and to raise those and to bring those to perhaps a more robust discernment process for the whole general public. I like your phrase, circle of discernment. That's <laughs> a good way to put it. Um, Dr. Mahan, um, do you want to add to that? I have another question yeah. for you, but go ahead and see if you want. Sure. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. First of all, it's really, really nice to be back here. Um, uh, I, I moved every, I mean, when I was here and every time I come back, this is the second time at the uh, tremendous um, uh, development that always takes place from month to month, um, the improvements, the bookstore, the conference room. That's, I mean, aesthetically. Um, but then this journal, hats off to you, uh, Safir and Najib and the team for pulling this off. I remember when we started, um, we had big dreams, but in my mind, I was always thinking, I just don't know how this is going to happen. 
But uh, I always, I when I talk about Safir, you know, I think of him as Colonel Hannibal Smith, <laughs> who at the end of, I don't know if you know the A-Team reference, he just, he, he, he puts a cigar in his mouth and says, I love it when a plan comes together. So. You should tell him about your phone, phone ringing thing that, that you have. <laughs> He's got, when I call him, he has that. The A team uh, ringtone. Um, that's an inside joke. So, um, you know, this is, the, this, is, this, is, this is the age of renewal um, in many ways. I just saw an announcement um, from the Triple IT. Um, they have a conference coming up in the fall on uh, inviting us to think about uh, renewal um, at Tajdeed. Um, we have this very journal, Renovatio, and before uh, we had settled on a title, in fact, I wasn't even uh, aware that this was um, in, in the hat. You know, things move very fast. We uh, it, at Notre Dame, in our Madrasa Discourses project that I'm working on, uh, we had in our proposal uh, the title Tajdeed for the journal where uh, uh, we're working on w in Urdu with our students in India and Pakistan. Uh, so it's the age of, of, of renewal, and may this really be springtime uh, for religions. I've always thought of um, you know, the GTU as, as a place where there already exists a kind of conviv conviviencia. Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah. uh, it's evocative <clears throat> of uh, whatever we, we read about Andalus and, um, uh, and the imagery that at least I carry in my mind. So um, on speaking of renewal, one more thing. I just found out in our conversations, uh, I didn't know this title, uh, What's Real and What Is Not, is from a Bob Dylan song. And one of our, um, one of our um, uh, members of our advisory board, Amit Safi, he edited a volume a while back called Progressive Muslims. Mm -hmm. And uh, his, he opened his essay with um, uh, Times Are A-Changing from Bob Dylan. And so uh, Bob Dylan seems to be inspiring renewal in, um, <laughs> in, uh, in the tradition, which is going to be a very fascinating thing uh, to look at at some point. I did want to push back on one thing, that um, you know, we don't have uh, uh, public voices. I mean, the GTU, their tagline is uh, where religion meets the world. Mm -hmm. And um, just next door, the Center for uh, Theology and Natural Science with um, uh, Ted Peters and Bob Russell, They've been doing, um, and they've been running the journal on, um, on theology and science, um, and they just received a wonderful grant um, to endow that center. And I know that um, they have a number of public programs. So that's a place that we could partner with. There are a few other initiatives, like Kalam Research, you know, who've been putting, right. putting things out. Um, there are, um, obviously, there are journals um, and online fora where the conversation is ongoing, and sometimes they can have a tremendous impact, like, Alt Muslima, which looks at the uh, you know specifically gender issues. Muhammad Fadil published a piece on there. Um, who, <laughs> Muhammad Fadil was published before with us in Seasons, yes. <clears throat> and he got uh, hundreds of thousands of hits instantly. So they can have a large impact. First things in the Catholic um, yeah. um, world that does um, uh, religion public life, uh, which is a religious response to culture, arts, mm -hmm. uh, politics. Um, and, and an even intellectual thought. So there, I, f I see that we, with this initiative, are putting ourselves in the, in the fray. Mm -hmm. And I really don't see an initiative like the one that we have um, 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 out there, which is obviously um, uh, seated in um, a, a Muslim liberal arts college, the only one of its kind that's accredited in the United States. So as, the, as such, I, it's a flagship, and may it, may it be so into the continuing f uh, future. So um, we're, we're, we're entering the fray, mm -hmm. and um, I think what um, uh, your team has put together um, uh, has, is, going to, is going to make a splash, and I hope that it's, uh, it's able to generate the con kinds of conversations um, sure. from journal to journal, and also uh, with uh, participants who come to the website and engage uh, the content. Yeah, if I could jump into that. Sure. Into that particular <laughs> fray. Uh, I think that, my, myself, I mentioned there's a dearth, not an absence of theologians. Uh, but I think what, what Rene Vazio is endeavoring, and there are others that are, of course, doing it, and many of those who are associated with those initiatives have actually written here. So mm -hmm. I, I right. don't think, yeah, that we're avoiding the fray in that sense. But I think uh, uh, Dr. Delp mentioned something in his article that was, to me, it was very uh, insightful, where he said that, uh, to paraphrase him, 
that classical values uh, can only survive in the atmosphere of natural law. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the deeper engagement and hence the opening uh, issue dealing with metaphysics is at a level that generally doesn't define the environment that the fray is taking place in. The scrum is generally not taking place in the realm of natural law. The scrum uh, isn't taking place in an intellectual environment that's rooted in sort of uh, Aristotelian essentialism. The scrum is taking place in an environment that's defined by the uh, empir empirical climate that really defines our age. And so I think our challenge, and hopefully it will, and it will be a, a contribution and definitely not the game changer, is to begin to move the fray because there's gonna be a lot of tussling and shoving and elbowing on the street, we just call it bogarting. There's gonna be a lot of <laughs> bogarting. But to move it from that field into this field, and I think that's really uh, what the journal and the associated effort and the college itself is all about. Go ahead. <clears throat> and I would like to uh, piggyback on this conversation as well. <laughs> Camelback. Camelback, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for Salah correcting for me, exactly. Spoken like an editor, I must say. <laughs> um, in terms of the word renewal, um, I was uh, very much, when I first heard the title and invited to participate, I was thinking of a very important moment that happened in the life of the Catholic community, and that is the moment of Vatican II. That moment we called a giornamento, a new beginning. Mm. And it was characterized by uh, Pope John, St. John the 23rd, when a journalist asked him, why a giornamento? Why a new moment? And he got up from this chair and he opened the window at the Vatican. And many of the reporters said, oh, he opened up the window to let the Holy Spirit in to the confines of the church. But actually, what happened was, John the 23rd was showing the reporter that what he wanted the church to do was to open the windows so that all people, all publics could see in and that the church could see out. And so the new beginning was a new moment for this conversation, for the possibility, and that the church should be characterized as people who like to start conversations. And I think that that's kind of what I see happening with the various types of articles that are in this mm -hmm. journal, the points where people can connect and engage. Um, so the aggiornamento is happening in the soul and it's in the seeing out, uh, the transparency, um, and maybe seeing in to the intellectual tradition, the metaphysics, the foundations that really ground all of our understanding. People might have that experience that Sheikh Hamza was talking about, an awakening. Um, <clears throat> and so this could very much happen um, in the experience of, of this journal. God willing. Um, I do want to pick up on something you, you, you mentioned also, which is um, this idea of a conversation. I mean, our stated aim is actually for scholars to lead a conversation, uh, both have a conversation with each other, different scholars from different faiths, from different fields, uh, but also uh, to lead a public conversation. Um, and what, which reminds me, um, I, Mohan, let me ask you this, because I think one of the things, um, uh, I know you and I, have had, we've had discussions about this before, but there are, on the one hand, um, philosophers and theologians and historians and people from the traditional sort of um, fields. Um, on the other hand, we have scientists and science and technology people in the modern world for now. Um, and a lot of times it seems like they're sort of talking past each other. You know, it's not really a conversation that's yet taken place. Um, and so the question I really have is about, you know, is there a forum, uh, can there be forums, and how do you think that conversation can actually take place? How can that engagement with those people take place? Well, um, you know, um, if you build it, they will come. <laughs> so um, this, is, this is how it's going to take place. Just, uh, you know, reference, um, 
our, the project that I'm in now is housed within a, a subgroup, uh, an initiative. It's called Contending Modernities, mm -hmm. Catholic, Muslim, and Secular. And they bring people together uh, around issues of our time. Mm -hmm. And they ask uh, scholars to engage those issues from the perspective of their own traditions. Um, uh, it may be a secular approach, it may be a Catholic approach, and it may be an, a Muslim approach. And within all of these, there are multiple approaches, but they put them into conversation. And obviously, this, this produces some very uh, abstract or academic uh, mm -hmm. material, and then they have the challenge of distilling it. So there's blogs and um, uh, podcasts that they're creating to try and disseminate that into the public. And so the medium you know, that we have online, um, uh, public events, um, uh, inviting um, uh, people uh, to actually engage, setting up a platform mm -hmm. uh, to engage in a conversation, that is, that is, the, um, uh, that is what, how it's going to happen. The challenge obviously is how do you stand out? Um, it's a cacophony. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We have, um, uh, everybody has a, a microphone. Mm -hmm. right. uh, every, you know, uh, you can have um, lots of followers or something can go viral. Um, so how do you develop um, a constituency, a following, a uh, community, mm -hmm. but then also not become insular and, mm -hmm. and go beyond that? And I think the way to do that is really to have people at the table who are trusted. Um, who are trusted within, if, we, if we're to set up two camps, like modern science and, um, uh, and traditional sort of religion, mm -hmm. just, to, just to make it clear. And then people who are trusted by each of those communities, that, and then to put them together and uh, create um, a forum for civil and a really meaningful conversation that can hopefully touch on first principles. Now, uh, there will be growth, I think, on both sides. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, so, that something, um, uh, I was reading all the articles um, uh, in Renovatio on, on the flight coming over, and Sheikh Hamzaz was just uh, you know, added online, so I was able to see it, um, uh, where he mentions that you know, when the tradition was formulated, uh, uh, s s people were thirsty for knowledge. And they were embracing, um, uh, they, were, they were picking up what was new. And then um, uh, they were viewed uh, with great suspicion by those who wanted to play it more, more safe. Right. But that uh, openness was dynamic and it created uh, an incredibly complicated, uh, complex, rich and beautiful tradition. Now we have new ideas coming in. And the question is, do we have the capacity and in what way will we engage that? And if that challenges some of the old notions, how are we going to be able to overcome those challenges? In, in, in this case now in a public forum, right. because it can be uh, unsettling and even decentering at times. So uh, it's, a, it's an exciting project. I think it's a dynamic project. And I think it's one that's evocative of the initial period, the early period when uh, when we w when when the tradition itself was being was being crafted, right. so I was meandering in a few different places. No, no, but no, I hope good. I got to. No, you did, you did. I think, and you raised a couple more questions for me. So, yeah. so. That's a good point. <laughs> I think it's important, though, to to uh, try to understand, in, in the sense that, to a, a large extent, Muslims were the hosts. Uh, who invited these new ideas into their home, uh, home or as Sheikh Hamza mentions in his article, into their abode. Mm -hmm. And now Muslims are the guests being invite, invited to someone else's abode. And to look at the new room and examine the new furniture. So I think it's very important for us to at least understand what our house should look like and even if we haven't fully constructed that house yet, to use it as sort of a, a, a mental template to uh, guide to what degree we're impressed by the furniture in the house we're being invited into. And so I think that's part of the, uh, the process here. 
let me pick up on that um, idea because I think to not to you know take the analogy too far, but it is a good analogy, so I'm going to use that. Um, the Muslim or the faith traditions, and broad, I mean, it's not just Islam, but it's also you know um, other faith traditions, certainly the Abrahamic traditions. The foundation, if you will, um, for the new house that you talk about, the Muslims are being invited into. It's the Muslims are fascinated by the furniture or you know whatever that might be, but it's built on a different foundation, right? It's built on a foundation that doesn't um, that's all about the physical world and nothing else, right? It's the foundation of it's, it's all physical. It, it's all if if it cannot be studied, it's not part of the foundation. If it not if it cannot be empirically studied, it's not part of the foundation. So how do you? How do you engage, and this is a question for all of you, but I think what you were talking about, so for Muslims or people of faith to engage with that, um, because the, you know, to use a different ana metaphor, an elephant in the room really is um, the material world and the immaterial, as Sheikh Hamza pointed out, the immaterial world, um, because that's not recognized in this new house, as you say, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we negotiate that? How do we navigate well, that? I'm not <laughs> System area, have to say. Sure, and, uh, but I'd also like to comment. Sure, on no, no, absolutely. No, no, you well, One of the things that is really, um, <coughs> in terms of looking at what's happening in the secular world, and as you were saying, you know, the furniture that's already there, um, is this myth of um, construction of knowledge. Right. And it seems that we are in control as to what we say is truth. We construct it. Um, we experiment with some ideas, we put it together, um, and we say, okay, we all agree, this is truth. That is such a myth that we're living our lives on. Um, and so, I, I, when I'm using the metaphor in terms of constructing, I think every place where we have to redo the walls, <laughs> we really have to think about those deeper questions, those questions mm -hmm. of not what I think or our society has done a survey on or the latest scientific uh, evidence points to. We have to really understand what all of, what truth is um, in its deepest level. And so we do need revelation. Mm -hmm. We don't check our reason at the door when we're experiencing revelation. The two, you know, go together. Um, but the thing is that we have to be wary of the fact that we are human beings constructing our truth. This is in the contemporary world. Right. And we're saying, yeah, that's truth. That's what we believe. It's a religion. But it's a religion that has been socially constructed by human beings. And I think religion wants the, the, the faith, those who have faith, want to challenge that notion of knowledge. And we want to say, no, there's a knowledge that is revealed to us. There's a knowledge that we grasp. Mm -hmm. it, there isn't a knowledge that we construct only. And I think that that's, that's really what the real dilemma is about. And I think pe we, are, we are to be feared when we're in the public square <laughs> because we ask those kinds of questions. Right. And we, we reveal the falsity, the myth, that we are comfortable in truth that has been basically humanly constructed. Good point. Go ahead, do you want, I you want to say that. Well, I really like this, um, uh, uh, this um, uh, analogy that's developing with the house and the furniture. Because you know we're in re renovatio, re we're in the process of renovation. And the question of foundations is an interesting one. Um, what I would say is I think we shouldn't mistake a kind of a methodological naturalism with a scientism that says that's all that exists. So one is a methodological, a procedural kind of move mm -hmm. where you have to make certain assumptions in order to carry out your work in, a, in an empirical way. But whether there's more than that out there, not everybody, uh, all of the science would say there's nothing. Those who would would be a kind, would be a science, uh, in, 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 would, would be pre professing a kind of belief in scientism. 
But that's an open question. We can put that aside. We still have to deal with the, the structure and, 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 and the furniture that's there. Now, when we talk about foundations, at least we know today, I mean, uh, I was here in California for five years. And in the home I was in, uh, towards the end, we moved around three times. Um, the house next door was getting foundation work done. But they were living in their homes. And uh, they had a company come. They dug out. And they lifted up the home. And they retrofitted and rebuilt the foundation. <laughs> and so you can do foundation. You don't have to demolish the house we know today in order to rethink about okay. foundations. And uh, I don't know if we can uh, con conceive of our uh, r r renovation activities in this earthquake retrofit kind of way. But in the end, I really want to tie it to Imam Zaid's point that before we were inviting people into our homes, like as a civilization. So there's a kind of confidence right. that comes with that. Right. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can be uh, creative. You can also take risks uh, because you're in power. And uh, you have uh, diff different kinds of uh, uh, fears that come in when you're not, mm -hmm. where everything could be taken away from you. And um, that's, that's definitely something to keep in mind. In the end, we may be able to bracket the questions of foundations, because you don't ultimately see them, and be able to present something that's purely compelling on the basis of aesthetics. This is, look at, look at this home. It's far more compelling. Mm -hmm. And we can continue to have the theoretical you know, conversations about the foundations while we celebrate um, the beautiful house that we've been able to build. And I think that uh, that speaks to the real pragmatic, the, 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 a kind of a, pra uh, uh, you shall know them by their fruits. Right, right. Like what are the outcomes of those beliefs? And how do they play themselves out in the world? And I think that's a very important uh, standard. But I think it's very important for us to recognize that, and I'm not saying you don't, or that you're <laughs> implying otherwise, that there are more fruits to a beautiful, healthy tree than fruit you can see, taste, smell, Absolutely. touch, and feel. Absolutely. Uh, and, and I think so in terms of where do we start this process, we started within ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we started, and I think Sheikh Faraz dealt with a lot of the theories that just us connect our thought process, our reason to our brain function. Mm -hmm. But that there's a deeper uh, reality to knowing mm -hmm. that encompasses other aspects of our being that are rooted in the non-neurological functions of our brain. That's something that's transcendent. And once the individual uh, cultivates his or her soul, they'll produce beautiful fruit in the world. There'll be beautiful architecture. There'll be beautiful legal thinking. But much of that, and, and they'll have the ability to go into any house with confidence. And to just say, you know, I'm not impressed with that couch. Because they have confidence with them themselves. And that confidence is rooted in their being in touch with certain metaphysical realities that provide them with the confidence to exist anywhere in the physical world. And that becomes a source of a different way of even envisioning the fruits of civilization. And I think that's something that we have to struggle, like us, the people of religion, to keep alive in the world. Because it's, it's very tempting to, to let that go and to hold on to something that might be impressed with certain standards of beauty, et cetera, that really don't acknowledge that deeper uh, foundation of even understanding of knowing, of assessing, of analyzing that transcends all of the stuff of the, of the physical world, if you will. So it starts within. And once a person has cultivated that quality, they can go into any house with confidence and make their contribution to the decor. But they can also begin, even the mo in the most simple ways, to build their own house that others will find attractive in its mm -hmm. own unique and beautiful ways. 
and that house is, is again, it's, it starts with building up the human being. Because at the end of the day, uh, where institutions, civilizations are just collectives of, of human beings. And if the human beings themselves reflect a certain way of seeing the world, and if that way of seeing the world is rooted in metaphysical foundations, then they're going to bring a unique beauty to the world. And if enough of them come together, they can begin to offer credible alternatives for people who are refugees from the madness of the reigning, produced by the reigning arrangement. If that makes sense. It does, it does. So my, I, I think I want to put it back to Mon for a second, because I, what you, if I understand what he just said, I, if you're, you're talking about creating something that sets an example and that shows how to make sense of the world yeah, in many nice ways, right? A nice room in the other people's house <laughs> okay. that everyone wants to hang out in. <laughs> right. Because it's different. Like, man, when I go in that room, I feel differently. And the art is different. And right. the furniture is different. <laughs> right. and, man, right. I, I kind of like that room. Right, and people are happier. <laughs> yeah, but the, the question with that is then, that room is going to be built on the other foundation. Not and necessarily, because, I mean, you've seen yourself rooms that are extensions of a house that aren't built on the original foundation. Right. <laughs> the me me <laughs> Thank you, okay. <laughs> Point well taken. Yeah, w one thing I wanted to ask um, uh, to all of you actually was one of the th recurring themes in the articles we've published so far in Avatio um, has been in some of the articles um, this issue of the, it's, it's a bit of a you know, critique, if you will, of scientism in many ways. It's about the um, lack of even acknowledgement or recognition that there's something immaterial, that we have a human soul, that we have a mind, that there's God. Um, but do we, as well, the religious people of faith and scholars, do we have something to uh, construct of more than that to offer? Um, and I think this is what Imam Zaid was getting at, maybe, but is, to, um, m that's more than a critique. That's more than just saying, you know, here's where you all, you meaning the, the scientists, mm -hmm. the scientists and people are wrong. Um, and what is it that, you know, how can we engage them with something more constructive? Mm -hmm. What do you think that is and how do we approach that? Because that's really the, where the conversation begins, I think. Right. So for, for me, you know, I think it would be very interesting if we had an issue, like a question like this, that the mind is immaterial. Right. That we have two pieces, that same the conversation. One by a pro, like, the, yes, the mind is material. And someone who is, you know, one of the leading scientists and who can make that case and explain why. Mm -hmm. Um, and then one by a theologian or a philosopher, and they don't have to be uh, two different people, um, making the other case and having the best of both arguments out there. And then the question will be, you know, how do we mediate that? And I think that that will be something that would be in a, in a beautiful editorial um, uh, that really captures the, the essence of the debate. And uh, being a, an academic journal, borrowing that from... Uh, from Sheikh Hamza, right. where you know there is, uh, we cannot um, combine things or academia with devotion. We don't remove the devotional element. We're not one-dimensional, um, or even two-dimensional. We're we're multi-dimensional, three-dimensional, right. and so um, some something that can capture that debate, and then from a religious uh, point of view, uh, really contextualize the debate and what's happened. Those those I think that would be a very very meaningful way to way to construct some of these debates. I mean, I think the, the other um, related issue is, you know, uh, I don't want to construct this as binary, meaning there's, you know, theologians on this side and there's scientists and technology people on the other side. As you mentioned, there are people, you know, there's gray areas of people who are scientists who are also believers. Um, but at the same time, isn't it, um, is it a question of where Theologians need to have a little bit better grounding in science in order to have that conversation. And on the flip side, do 
the people doing the science and the technology, the visionaries in the tech industry, for instance, uh, do they need to understand and have a better grounding in theology and metaphysics, really? That would, I mean, is that part of, of, of the... Absolutely. I mean, if it's going to be one article, then you have to be a master of both if you're going to right. present both sides. Like you said with Imam al-Ghazali, like you have to... Uh, you have to write the book on evolutionary biology and prove that before you, <laughs> you refute evolutionary right. biology. You have to be able to demonstrate that, right. and it should be done in a way that the experts in that field say, "Yes, our views have been represented, you know, um, accurately." Um, I would say that you know our theologians have been philosophers of science. Mm -hmm. I mean, when they think about being, right. the grounding of being. Uh, the, the, the nature of, of matter, particles, whether it's a continuum. Where, I mean, they had to do these things philosophically, but they were thinking about issues that now are coming into the domain of physics when they're thinking about what makes up the stuff. Mm -hmm. and, they're, um, uh, and they're investigating that from a physical perspective. Obviously, the metaphysical question is not obviated. Where does all that, all, all, where does the quantum flux arise from, right? So. Um, you kick the can a little bit, but you have to take the contemplations that we have about the nature of physical reality seriously that mm -hmm. we are arriving at through our experiences uh, and empirical studies of the world. And I think that the theologians of the past would not dismiss that, and they shouldn't do that today either. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah, go ahead. So it's when this Sorry. new knowledge mm -hmm. comes into conversation with scripture and tradition, is that is the real, and that's where the, the where the where the exciting stuff uh, is going to happen. Yeah. I agree with that 100%, but I would just like to, yeah. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to add, though, that I think that that's the challenge for some, and the job and the role for some theologians to really master science and make those contributions to be the Muslim Robert Spitzer, who Sheikh Faraz in his summation of Kalam cosmological argument uh, references new arguments for the proof of God rooted in modern science and mathematics. So you definitely need Muslims at that level. But you also need Muslims that are deeply, deeply steeped in the metaphysical tradition as not theoreticians, as practitioners. For lack of a better word, you need some serious Sufis. Because that's where the common people began to look at the world differently. And the common people are the, the incubators of change. And so for our society to begin to change, you definitely need that element of the science philosopher, the scientist, philosopher, theologian, who introduces ideas that affect the masses through intellectual trickle-down. Economic trickle-down didn't work, hasn't worked, but perhaps intellectual trickle-down will work. But you need people who are holy people, for lack of a better term, that people began to see that uh, alternative source of being reflected through them. And that uh, impacts societies in many instances in far deeper ways than what they're impacted by in terms of what trickles down from that level of thought. Did you give one quick example? Uh, many of you are familiar with uh, Richard Bullitt's uh, Islam, The View from the Edge, and he traces this family through five generations through the, uh, the uh, Tabakat literature. And so Dinar, he takes Shahada. And his son Suleiman, he doesn't really know much about Islam, but he makes a rain prayer. He leads a rain prayer, and then it rains. And so all of the people in that region look at him as a holy man and begin to have great esteem for Islam as a religion. And that really opens the door for the subsequent uh, uh, deepening of Islam in that region through his son, Ahmed, who meets uh, Kurz bin Webra and then formally learns the religion. But it was the action of the holy man and not the action of the scholar 
that really opened the hearts of the people to begin to look at reality, to look at the world from this new way of looking at it. So I think you need both and not just the one. And I'm and not trying to imply that Dr. <coughs> Hans saying we just need the one. But I think we need, we need both. And when the two are healthy and functioning, that's when we can have a real uh, renewal in our societies. Uh, before we have a few minutes left, I wanted to see um, Sheikh Hamza if I could invite you back up for a few minutes to join the conversation, inshallah. So we've been hearing all about this conversation about this sort of, a, um, you know, theologians on the one hand and, and, and the modern science and technology. What are your thoughts on how the, we can actually begin to engage with? you know, um, that they can have a real conversation. <clears throat> Bismillah. Well, I think I, the first thing, the most important thing is that, that our traditions have a completely different understanding of science and what science means. Um, and, and also, uh, science traditionally was a, a branch of philosophy. It's, this is the way the, the pre-modern world saw it, whether they were Muslim, Christian, or Jewish. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the natural sciences are part of, uh, of the philosophical tradition, and they, they emerge out of the method is preceded by the metaphysics, so they emerge out of the metaphysics. So for instance, the, the Catholic Church outlawed the use of crossbows uh, in their war uh, because they were unethical. Um, the Muslims, uh, according to uh, um, the book, uh, The History of Bombing, uh, by um, an, uh, a, uh, a linguist, I think is his name. Uh, he, he argues that the very first um, s rules of engagement were actually articulated by Muslims. Um, uh, and they were ethical. You could not use poison arrows. I mean, this is in the books of fiqh. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in Muhtasar Khalil, it, it's, it says it is prohibited to use a poison arrow. Uh, you could not poison wells. You could not cut down fruit trees. These were ethical principles that were that emerged out of a metaphysical understanding about um, uh, human beings and 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 their dignity. Um, you could not mutilate bodies. I mean, what greater mutilation than blowing somebody up? Mm. I mean, it was prohibited. Sharia prohibits the mutilation of bodies, and and to mutilate your own body, which is cr created. Uh, it's 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 a it's a it's a, it's a representative of God on earth. It's the, it's the caliph of God on earth, and so the, these are things that are really I think important for our religious communities to understand, which which has been lost. Um, it's arguable whether or not a deeply uh, spiritual civilization could have created the car, um, and I think the car down the road is going to be seen as one of the worst inventions in human history. The number of people that are killed. On, on a yearly basis all over, let alone animals. And I was once making an argument with a taxi driver in Abu Dhabi about how terrible cars were. And he started arguing with me, no, 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 there's nothing wrong with cars. And right then he hit a cat. And it was just amazing because, uh, you know, it's horrible when you hit an animal uh, with, with a car. Um, but, but, uh, all these things, yeah, these, these are all metaphysical problems. And they're deeply rooted problems. So, so I think science, the thing is, we're not anti-science, but we have to understand what, what is the science that you're producing and where does it come from? And what are the assumptions of that worldview that's producing that science? Um, in Vietnam, they produced the neutron bomb, or, or the, uh, the napalm. And, and so the Viet Cong would put lakes in their, in their villages because the napalm, if you went into the water, it would stop the burning. So some scientist here uh, decided to invent napalm that didn't stop burning with white, water. White phosphorus. And, and yeah, white phosphorus. I mean, Fallujah was called Operation Shake and Bake because they used white phosphorus to bake human beings. So, so what, what, what type of a civilization does things like that? I mean, you know, these, these fanatics chop off people's heads and, and they say, oh, they're so barbaric. And then we're dropping bombs. We just killed 200 civilians uh, in, in Mosul yesterday, you know, 
So it's sanitized barbarism, that's all it is, because it's from 30,000 feet as opposed to chopping off the head, which is definitely barbaric. It's horrible uh, to do that, especially m the vast majority of these people become completely innocent people. But we're not innocent, we're just much better at it. You know, it's like garbage. In the Muslim world you go in, it's garbage is everywhere, but at least you know what the society's producing. In our culture, it's all hidden. We produce much more garbage. Mm -hmm. uh, but they go into landfills, and, and there's a massive, in the middle of the, the, uh, the ocean, there's this mastic, massive plastic, uh, it's huge, it's bigger than the state of Texas. It's all garbage in the middle of the ocean. So this is our civilization, but, uh, you, you know, so I really, I'm just challenged this whole, uh, just this, this attitude that people have towards science and bowing before this idol of, of science, I think is, is, is one of the worst aspects of our culture. Sheikh you, you just said that you're not, we're not against science. Um, so what, what needs to happen about in science for us to be able to engage with it and to, how can we affect that? I mean, what needs to change? Is it more something deeper and fundamental in terms of its uh, worldview that it's based on? Or is it something more easier than that? No, definitely, it goes back to what are the assumptions and right. what is the human being? What is our purpose? Um, c consumerism, the c consumer society cannot continue and, and it can't spread. The Chinese now all want to be, live like Americans. And, and we will need three Earths just to w the natural resources necessary to supply uh, the, the use. But the, the biosphere won't it, it won't, it won't be able to sustain it anyway. I mean, the fish are going. We're, we're already losing the fish in the ocean. Uh, the, the, literally, the jellyfish are taking over, which is an amazing, I mean, God, I think, has just such a wonderful way of showing us who we are, because uh, you know, I've, I've made an argument in, in, in environmentalism, it's not the cockroaches and rats that are disappearing. It's, it's all these high animals. It's, it's, it's like eagles and falcons and tigers and lions and leopards, because those are qualities within us. All, all Aboriginal peoples named their, they didn't name their children cucaracha, you know, like a cockroach or something. They, they, named, they named their children things like Asad and Fahad, lion and, 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 and leopard and wolf and because, and eagle. You know, the because majestic one, they were yeah. the majestic one. And even the bee, what a beautiful creature and it's disappearing. We don't even see butterflies. I grew up in this area. People that grow up in this area know how many butterflies we used to have in this area in springtime. We don't see butterflies anymore. You know, so these are all things that, I mean, we, you cannot keep going to Starbucks and just getting that, that, that thing and throwing it away and think you can do that forever. At a certain point, people have to say enough. Well, go ahead. You, you've been. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, okay. I, you know, I think um, you know one of the things we may it may, help, may help us to distinguish between science and sort of the applied science and the and the ethics. Because mm -hmm. um, you know, Socrates argued that you know writing shouldn't be introduced because it would take away people wouldn't remember things anymore. Um, and the same with rhetoric, because it could be used to prove something that's not true or to persuade someone for something. But these are, these are technologies that can be used for, for good, good or bad. And uh, the, you know, uh, I think one of the really interesting questions for us is can, can science, you know, when a technology is, is, is unleashed, to what extent is that tied to sort of basic research and, and are just for the sake of understanding nature and, and, and God's creation and reality at one level. And can that be separated from the political sort of ways in which then that gets used and, 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 and abused? So th those are d very difficult questions. Um, you know, when, when we look at it, uh, 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 what they're doing in neuroscience, which they're saying is still in its infancy, it's like the number of connections in the, in one cubic inch of the brain or centimeter, I don't know, just a small amount, is like all the stars in the galaxy. As these neurons are firing back and forth, and you know, what kind of, what kind of matter is that, material is that? And what does it generate? And how is, is that material connected to maybe something that's, that's immaterial? These are really interesting theological questions. And when we alter the chemistry of the brain, people have accidents, their memories are affected, they become right. different people. So there's something that's tied to the chemi chemistry. 
about who I, my perception of who I am and how I project myself and maybe even how I know myself. These are really, really difficult questions and questions on, um, on cosmology and the nature of, you know, um, uh, um, uh, just time and how we have come to be where we are and who we are and where we might be going from theories in ev evolutionary biology. They produce serious issues about, you know, how we conceive of the, the, the person. And um, those are v very interesting, but how that science then gets applied and used to do the ho horrible things in the world, um, you know, can it be controlled? And, and these are questions that maybe are not asked or they take place behind, you know, secret walls where, uh, where there's a greater plan being undertaken by those in power who, um, who, uh, who use the, the you know, advanced technology uh, in order to maintain a kind of dominance. We don't know. These are all connected questions. And I don't know if our journal is going to be able to, you know, uh, as we move forward, hopefully tackle them one by one. Um, um, I think that you're right. I mean, I think one of the things we're thinking about is really to pr at least pose the right questions. Yeah, the questions. That's where we have to begin, right? So the journal is trying to do that. If you see the articles that are already on there and what we have in plans, inshallah, will be posing the right questions mm -hmm. and by people who, who can articulate these questions well, because those are the things that people are not even thinking about. That's not even on their radar. Right. So that's what the, our contribution, we hope, will be. But Imam Zaid, go ahead. Another thing, uh, in addition to posing the right questions, uh, I think it's very important for us at this particular historical juncture to be able to put a limit on the questions we ask. I mean, one of the things our Prophet forbade, excessive questioning. Uh, because I think we've seen, uh, not just with the automobile, uh, but so many areas that we thought were good and positive uh, turn out to be terribly wrong. Everything from nuclear energy, uh, <coughs> digital images, Dr. Delp's article, just how our entire psyche has been taken over mm -hmm. by digital images. They're literally everywhere. And, 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 and the difficulty in escaping these things, I right. mean, I mean, the online version after Dr. Delp said you can't read a scholarly article without being interrupted by a video. His scholarly article is interrupted by a video. So obviously it's very difficult to escape these things. Uh, but at a certain point, like, where do we begin to say there must be some limits because uh, just the sort of introduce it uh, it looks good at first. Yeah. When it proves to be bad, then mm -hmm. it's just uh, a fait accompli. Mm -hmm. It's here. There's nothing we can really do about it. How can we best manage the damage? Right. So I think we have to begin to uh, reflect on the wisdom and uh, excessive questioning. That, it's a, I think it's an excellent point, and it's also a traditional, in traditional Islamic kalam, the idea that the intellect could determine the, the rightness or the wrongness of any given thing was, was something inconceivable. Like you, you, ethically, you can, mm. but in terms of what that actual thing is in reality, uh, you don't know. And um, there's a story about the, the man who, Chinese man who, uh, his, his, his horse ran away and all the villagers came and they said, oh, this is terrible. And he said, maybe. And the next day, the horse came back with seven wild horses. And, that, and all the villagers came, and they said, oh, this is wonderful. And he said, maybe. <laughs> and, and, and then his son was breaking in one of the horses, and it threw him, and he broke his leg. And the villagers came, and they said, this is terrible. And he said, maybe. And then the next day, the, the, uh, the, the emperor sent 
troops to conscript the young men, and because his son had a broken leg, they couldn't take him to war. And the villagers came, and they said, oh, this is wonderful. <laughs> and he said, maybe. <laughs> so the, po the point of that is, is that you cannot determine in any given thing. And, and uh, Robert Ornstein wrote a very important book, I think, called The Axe Maker's Gift. The technologist always tells you the wonderful things of this new product. Uh, the, uh, people do more laundry now with washing machines than they did before, because people used to have just one time when they did laundry. And now the laundry machine is actually, there's more time spent on laundry. People wore clothes longer. Uh, they probably stunk more, but um, that, that was just part of life. So I think that's a, that's a really important point that Imam, uh, Imam Zaid just made. And, th and that, uh, that aspect is just really important for us to keep in mind. One other point that I would like to make is as we're talking about the different sciences, we've stayed pretty much in terms of the scientific uh, mm -hmm. hard sciences, but I also want to throw into the mi mix the, the social, social sciences, social sciences yeah. and they are very, um, insinuate themselves into bodies of truth that we right. absolutely believe in and profess in, yeah. and we also find out down the road, you know, new ideas and, and it becomes very manipulative um, in terms of a construction of knowledge also. And um, the, so I think that we have to be conscious of that as well. I think th the idea of a conversation is to bring, I was thinking as we were discussing about science and theology, I thought, boy, I think, oh, and you know, in the 13th century, uh, in the 12th century, some medieval theologians were having the similar conversation and the question was, what do we do with philosophy? And how do we bring philosophy into theology? And, um, uh, and that was the question. And the, and the idea was that philosophy could pr provide the best set of questions that wouldn't necessarily derail theological ideas, but actually gave life uh, it really gave a new insight in terms of the theological idea ideas. Whenever I teach Thomas Aquinas, I always, re I always want my students to recall that as he's busy doing his fantastic writing of a number of different genres, he's also a man of prayer. He's going and he's doing his holy office and that influences his way of uh, inquiry. And why was he doing all this inquiry, Imam Zaid, to your point? Why was he doing all this inquiry? Why was he trying to uh, not just present a summary of theology, but really give theology it, its best life and light so people could understand? It's because he was training men to be confessors and preachers, that they would have an influence on the whole of the Catholic community, to your point so that the intellectuals had a sense of responsibility to share this knowledge in a way that would help people to um, deepen their own faith and understanding. Um, I think we're running out of time, so I'd like to end with one last question to all of you to answer, and maybe you can just go down this way, um, which is if you, um, you know, we, we just launched this journal. We're, we're beginning to do some stuff, and, it, and God willing, we'll, we'll, we'll get better at it, and we'll do the, raise the questions and start the conversations, and we'll do, do what we can. If you had one suggestion to make to us as the editorial team of the Renovatio, uh, what would it be that would, you think would make it successful and sustainable in the long run? Uh. I think to be true to its vision, and uh, <laughs> to be true to its stated vision and mission, and to be uh, radically different. And because I think a lot of the things Dr. Mahan mentions very good points, but I think there are places where these conversations are taking place, right. and so. That work is being done, and so to really, I think, be uh, the focal point or the locus of a different type of conversation, one that really challenges uh, the reigning, the status quo intellectually, the intellectual status quo, to look at things differently, that it has to be radically committed to the metaphysical, has to be radically committed 
to uh, asking the kinds of questions that usually don't get asked around a lot of the topics that were talked about here tonight. So they are being asked in some places, but there are, there are a whole set of questions that either are being skirted or they're being uh, diminished or avoided altogether. And those are the questions that are rooted in an entirely different worldview and an entirely different way of looking at reality. And I think Renovatio should be the place that is, is really strongly, powerfully committed mm -hmm. to asking those types of questions. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mahan. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, um, one, one suggestion, not 10. <laughs> well, I think then, um, you know, uh, following Imam Zaid, um, uh, that um, if we're going to be, you know, radically different, a kind of a response it's, it's uh, a response to, to modernity. What, when we define a question for, or a theme, it would be really nice to have like um, uh, someone who writes uh, a kind of like maqasid al-falasifa within the issue. Like here is um, a modern uh, articulation of an issue uh, that uh, really is representative of a kind of uh, thought that needs to be engaged. And then there can be pieces that address from a scriptural, from a traditional, from an aesthetic um, point of view, uh, different ways to, to look at that issue that, that hopefully you know, can be radically different mm -hmm. and yet convincing because it doesn't defy any of the established conventions that m new knowledge has uh, you know, put before us. So I don't know if that's, uh, you, you got it. Yes, so. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I did, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Sister Marianne? Um, right, writing. Um, I think that too often some of our journals can get narrow and we get very specific and our journals, um, the writing gets too narrowly focused. Mm -hmm. So write, look at a question universally with the great diversity, um, uncover the substantive questions and the assumptions that are underneath even your question. I was looking at this picture and um, I was trained uh, formally as a graphic designer and one of the odd jobs I had was to clean paintings. And one of the things that you see in here in the picture is you see that half of it is cleaned or a light is being shown. Um, and I think it reveals the true nature of the picture, the true colors, the true uh, um, design of the picture. And so even when you ask the question, hopefully, um, you can uncover whatever that subject matter is or topic in such a way that it reveals the real beauty of even your question mm. um, and to write. I think the most important thing is to encourage writing and to encourage young people to write. So maybe there's a space in this magazine where you could have entries coming from students because I think getting into the habitus, to the habit of being a universal intellectual, one who writes for the world, is something that we have to do. Thank you for that. No, I think that's something Sheikh Hamdad already talked to us about. We were going to start doing some student work as well. So encouraging writing is a, is a great idea. Sheikh Hamdad, I'll leave it to you to um, wrap it up yeah, for us. Just with you know, I think one, be bold. We have to be bold and be willing to make mistakes. Hopefully nothing that would get us into trouble with God, but be willing to make mistakes. And, and then also recognizing form and content, that, you, that one of the things that the modern world is, uh, it's incredibly ugly, um, our buildings are ugly, our clothes are ugly. Uh, increasingly, we're just seeing ugliness. Even the music is very ugly. Um, tr all traditional cultures share a sense of beauty. And I think the loss of beauty uh, is something really, really tragic. Um, people, it's interesting that self-serve is, is the dominant mode of our civilization. Self-serve. It's like we serve ourselves and so God's just made everything self-service and it's horrible. It used to be you went to the gas station and, and it wasn't self-serve and, and people had jobs. 
now everything's just become self-serve. And, and, and so I think service of the self, this, this, uh, this loss of a sense of who we are, and part of who we are is, is the ihsan is in, in us to make things beautiful. Um, I, t I tell this story just about when, when I was in Mauritania, one of the things that really struck me was um, the big pens spread out in the, in the desert with these, uh, the Mauritanians, who traditionally used um, um, pens that were made out of bamboo. But the big, they didn't leave the big pen the way it was. They ornamented them with leather. Uh, and, 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 and just they had to put this cover on the big pen. And I remember asking somebody, why did they do that? And they said, they're so ugly. <laughs> Um, and, and, and it's very interesting, this functionalism, this idea of just yeah. functionalism. Things should be functional. No, you could just have a carpet. Why did, they, why did they make these beautiful designs? What was in them that necessitated them to make it beautiful? And you look at modern carpets and they're ugly. It's as simple as that. The buildings are ugly. The clothes are ugly. People don't, you know, you don't, now people say, I dress for myself, exactly. <laughs> like, traditionally people dress for other people. It's like perfume. You don't wear perfume for yourself. Sure. You wear it, it's a charity for other people. Um, so the, this is, just this sense of aesthetic to me is incredibly important. Um, and it's, it's been foundational in terms of the way I see, you know, I, I just look at the Muslim world and the traditional Muslim world is so stunningly beautiful. I mean, the Taj Mahal is one of the most visited places in the world. The Alhambra Palace is one of the most visited places in the world. Why? Because people go in there and they just, they're just overwhelmed by the sheer beauty of it. Well, what were they like, those people that produced those things? Mm -hmm. and, and what are people gonna say about us, the people that produced the plastic bottle, <laughs> you know? People that when they dig down and look or watch YouTube a hundred years from now and wonder what <laughs> what were these people thinking of? Like you never see a tradition. Look at Native American Indians. Look at Curtis's photographs of these Native Americans. Mm -hmm. Look at the dignity in those people. Like what is it in them that they had to look like that? They're not doing selfies or putting rabbit ears on, you know, uh, red cloud. You know, they're they're there with some sense of what a human being is. And those are, those are aboriginal people, but they knew what a human being was. Why have we forgotten that? And so just, I think that's to me a, at the essence of form and content. I, they can't be separated. Um, I wanna particularly thank um, Safir and his team did an incredible job. Thank all of you for coming, uh, Imam Zaid as always, um, and Dr. Mahan, thank you for coming out here for this. Sister Marianne, um, who's just a real blessing for us on the Hill. Um, she, uh, she's just been such an incredible friend to the Muslim community, and we're, we're fortunate to have her uh, as a friend. And uh, thank all of you for coming out, and um, all the people online also, we thank you for coming in. Please uh, support. Uh, the college uh, with whatever you're able to, uh, not the least of which certainly um, is your prayers. Uh, and thank you and barakallah fikum jami'an inshallah. Subhanakallahu alhamdulillah, shadu an la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruku wa natubu ilayk. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.